All right. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? I know people are still joining us, but we've uh, already got a lot of folks with us, and um, there's plenty to uh, get on to today. So welcome, everybody. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the uh, director of the Coalition for Networked Information, and I'd like to welcome you to the opening day of the virtual event that's part of our December 2021 member meeting. Um, it's really great you're here. I'm delighted to see so many member reps, guests. Uh, one of the wonderful things about the virtual environment is that we have been able to be a bit more flexible about um, having uh, additional folks from our member institutions join us. And uh, uh, so I welcome those folks as well who are able to be with us. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our international guests. Um, I suspect this may be one of the um, easiest international trips you've ever made. Um, I think uh, making international trips in person for the foreseeable future is gonna be challenging. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to a number of groups who are with us, um, the Clear Fellows, and you'll be hearing from some of those later. Uh, the Leading Fellows, um, they are going to be uh, presenting at the in-person part of the meeting, uh, which will take place next week, but we may have a few of them with us today. Uh, ARL LCDP Fellows, and um, I know we have at least a few members of the upcoming cadre of ARL Leadership Fellows. And uh, I would that, that cadre officially starts, as I understand it, in January of 22. But I was, um, I, I was very pleased and um, happy to see uh, that a number of active members of the CNI community were among those selected for that leadership cadre. So I uh, congratulate those folks. I, I note that we are running this session as a web meeting, not a webinar format as we have in our past virtual meetings. That means among other things that you can um, see who else is here with us um, uh, by looking at the participants. And you can uh, chat either directly with individual people or you can, um, you can share things with the group. And uh, I'd invite you to do that as um, appropriate. I hope that will make things feel just a little bit more interactive. Um, we also uh, will be taking questions at the end of each session, assuming there's enough time. Uh, and we are on a tight schedule, more on that in a little while. Uh, but um, uh, please put questions in the chat as we go along and we'll try and answer them either as the session's running at the end, offline, whatever we are able to do. Um, Please do uh, stay muted unless you're speaking. Um, uh, that is one downside to uh, doing things as a, uh, as a web meeting. I also note that we have a Slack channel and a set of subchannels set up for the meeting. This is primarily for um, people who want to communicate with presenters for the on-demand pre-recorded sessions. And I do want to note that a few days ago, we did release a very, very large um, wealth of pre-recorded sessions, some 40 odd of them, uh, which are available and will continue to be available um, uh, during the meeting and after the meeting publicly. Uh, we hope that you're finding time or will find time to have a look at those and that you're finding them useful. And um, uh, do feel free to use the Slack channel where um, appropriate to try and uh, uh, communicate with the presenters. Uh, we've asked all the presenters as well to, of course, put their email and other 
contact information in those pre-records. So um, uh, just dropping them a line and um, setting up a time to talk with them is another possibility. Before we go any further, I'd just like to take a moment to introduce two relatively new members of the um, CNI team uh, that many of you may not have met. Uh, Paige Pope, um, who is uh, taking uh, Diane's old uh, role as communications uh, coordinator, and uh, Kennedy Mangus, who has been uh, a tremendous help uh, with a whole range of communication and social media um, issues. Um, and uh, I am deeply appreciative of all of the work that both of them have done to get this uh, series of um, in-person and virtual uh, events for this December happening. So um, I wanted you all to be able to put faces with names. I know many of you have been in touch with them through email. This has been a very intense fall. Um, for a number of campuses, uh, this has been the first time that students have been back in uh, full numbers since the pandemic started. Um, in the broader world, um, we see events coming back. Um, uh, there are scholarly meetings happening now. Um, I understand that the uh, American Geophysical Union is meeting uh, next week, as are we. Uh, they're a little bigger than we are. I understand they're expecting over 10,000 people in New Orleans. Um, some of you were in person at the Charleston meeting recently. Uh, I saw a few folks um, from our community at EDUCAUSE in October when they met in person in Philadelphia. Uh, other kinds of activities are also coming back. Sports seem to be in full swing um, uh, with zillions of people at both the uh, college and the professional level. Um, we're seeing performing arts, concerts, plays, things of that nature starting to come back uh, carefully. But one of the things that I continue to be struck by as I speak to our member institutions um, around the country and beyond is how very variable the paths that um, different institutions and different regions of the United States um, have taken in transiting the pandemic to date. Um, some places were really shut down for a year. And as I say, just have ju are just winding up their first semester with all the students back. Others basically never closed or didn't close for very long or didn't close down all that hard. And when we look at institutions internationally, um, uh, of course, the picture is even more widely variable. So I would just um, remind everybody that um, there really is a lot of um, varied experience out there. And um, one of the um, one of the things that we all need to guard against is assuming that our our experience coming through this or our institution's experience is typical um, of all the other institutions' experience. Having given that context, let me talk a little bit about the December CNI meeting and how we've structured it. I'm hoping that at least for CNI, this will be the beginning of our effort to map out how we've incorporated what we've learned during our period of forced virtual operation during the pandemic with our hopefully growing ability to come back in person and come together in person and to, to, to try and understand how to combine those two. Um, I hope that our experience will 
be useful to other in, other organizations that are already grappling with this. Um, uh, there are lots of unanswered questions here. I am confident we won't get this exactly right and that we're going to have to adjust and learn from what worked and what didn't work, just as we have been consistently evolving our online events throughout the pandemic. So please bear with us, please help us, and please be mindful that even if you make a suggestion and we do something very different, um, that um, we are trying to listen to everybody, but that there is an enormous lack of consensus about what the right things to do are going forward. Um, I will just you know, say that reading evaluations from our online um, events over the last year ha it just makes your head spin because um, uh, the, the views are incredibly different from respondent to respondent. The basic rule we've tried to follow is to do what works well virtually in the virtual environment and to do what works best in person in the face-to-face -face environment. That seems straightforward enough, but making the choices um, uh, is trickier than it looks. We understand increasingly ever more <clears throat> that your time and in particular your attention is really precious and scarce. And that seems to be particularly true online. It's not just Zoom fatigue. There's some other things going on here. A sense of information overload that's become exacerbated by the move to virtual environments and virtual meetings. <clears throat> I'm still trying to fully understand the dynamic of what's going on here. And um, I've had a lot of confirmation talking with people informally about this. Uh, um, and I'd love to talk further offline with people about exactly how these phenomenon are unraveling. Um, but in response to that sense um, of very scarce precious attention, we've scheduled a very limited series of online synchronous sessions, basically two afternoons plus one hour. And we're running them on a tight time schedule. Um, that may mean that we're not going to have much chance to do interactive Q&A and we'll have to handle them in the chat or you'll have to talk to presenters offline and I'm sorry about that but that was the price of the trade-off. For the synchronous sessions, we've tried to pick broadly important and high impact things, and also things that in an ideal world, we might've liked to do in person, but that we couldn't do in person or that are impractical to do in person. For example, um, you will see, um, uh, international sessions in the, um, in the synchronous, uh, um, in the synchronous virtual meeting that at least under the present circumstances would not have been feasible to do um, in person. As I mentioned earlier, we have a wealth of pre-recorded sessions and I don't want to take anything away from their significance or importance or interest uh, by noting that those were pre-recorded rather than done in the synchronous sessions. We simply made judgments about what would be of interest to the largest number of people, um, particularly people who would actually be attending the CNI synchronous meetings. In many cases, I suspect the highest impact for some of those pre-records is going to be people to, uh, on people who might not come to the CNI meeting or might not attend the synchronous components for one reason or another. And I would particularly invite you to share um, 
with your colleagues um, uh, at your institution and beyond those um, pre-recorded sessions when you think they would be of interest. By contrast, while attention is really precious in the virtual environment, um, the in-person meeting is sort of a speculative pre-commitment of time and a commitment to an experience. And what we're doing there is um, we are stressing interaction networking, conversation, and again, broadly important, high impact developments, topics and issues, and the sort of things where we hope that networking and in person can carry on beyond the individual sessions. Um, the in person meeting, if you go or if you look at the schedule is much more leisurely than in the past. It's smaller. Um, and we have a maximum of three, and in many cases, only two parallel sessions taking place in the non-plenary uh, slots. Moving most of the project briefings to pre-recordings has really given us room to change the character of the meeting and at a certain sense to recapture, we hope, um, what CNI meetings were like a number of years ago when CNI was a somewhat smaller organization. Note also that the in-person meeting is now going to be comprehensively professionally um, captured on video. We will have a video crew in each of the rooms. Um, so unless there's a session where the presenter um, specifically asks not to be recorded, we will make available a full um, a full recorded record of those in-person meetings. I also want to mention the executive roundtables for a minute. These are going to stay virtual. They are something that turned out to work much better in the virtual environment because we can bring in people that would be impractical to bring in in person. Um, and that's really important for our ability to address a range of topics on the through the executive roundtables. Um, we can also hold them more often than the um, lockstep schedule of the in-person meetings um, as issues and uh, time um, uh, permits and requires. I do want to note finally, as we talk about um, uh, hybrid meetings, in-person meetings, virtual meetings, that we're going to close out the virtual conference with a presentation on Thursday um, and a conversation about how scholarly societies are thinking about the um, future of meetings, virtual and in-person. So that should be a very interesting bookend to my comments here and our experience here. Our executive roundtables that are being held in conjunction with this meeting are on priorities for major capital investments in digital infrastructure. We had the first yesterday, we'll hold the second convening on Friday. And I think you're gonna find the report on this very interesting. Um, this, is, this whole question of infrastructure and infrastructure investments is kind of a theme of this meeting. I'll say some more about this in my opening in-person plenary, but you can see that theme reflected in many of the synchronous sessions and also in the sessions in the in-person meeting. So um, as I say, I'll have a little more to say about this in my opening plenary for the in-person meeting but do be mindful of that theme. And speaking of that, um, that takes me to the introduction to the next session. And I'm going to start in a little early with some background and some framing remarks. And I'm sorry for people who tuned in just for the, um, for the Along Came Google session, uh, but you can pick up um, the recording for anything you missed because I'm starting a few minutes early. So this is one of the great 
infrastructure investment stories of our time. Um, perhaps um, uh, the only one I can think of um, off the top of my head on a similar scale is the development of Internet 2 and re the, the research and education networks, Edgerome and all the things that came along with that. Um, uh, but that's a very different kind of infrastructure investment um, than um, the story of the digitization of so much of our book um, cultural heritage. So we'll be joined momentarily by Roger Schoenfeld and Deanna Markham, hopefully, of uh, Ithaca SNR. Uh, Deanna alerted me um, uh, a day or so ago that, um, that she might be a little late, although I see a message that she has arrived while I've been speaking, so that's wonderful. Um, both Deanna and Roger will be well known to you um, uh, for their work at Ithaca SNR. Deanna, though, has had a fabled career, um, uh, including a um, important stint as um, the uh, associate librarian of Congress, um, where she um, played a um, really important role in so much of what the Library of Congress did trying to um, find its place in the digital world and also um, at CLEAR. So um, I'm delighted to have them with us. They've written this wonderful book, which I was fortunate enough to be able to read in draft. Um, and it's really, it's really just an extraordinary story um, of, um, of uh, the, the whole move to digitize, digitize uh, libraries. A number of people I've talked with about the book have described a strange experience reading it in that they're sort of reading a story of their own lives and of experiences that they went through personally. Um, and uh, it's surprising the number of people who have shared that reaction with me. It may be that some of us are just getting to be of a certain age, um, but uh, it, it's striking to me. Uh, Roger and Deanna recently had a conversation with Brewster Kale of the Internet Archive, and the video of that's available at the Internet Archive site. We are going to carefully not duplicate topics that were covered there, but you really can get that sense from Brewster as well of, um, uh, you know, you're, you're reading a book about things that you lived through and to some extent participated in. I cannot resist noting that um, in spring 2005, the opening plenary for the CNI spring meeting was the first public appearance of all of the five initial Google Library participants. They got up at the opening plenary session and talked about the, what they were doing. And at some level, that was the first time, I think, that the broader community really started to understand what was going on beyond the non-disclosure agreements uh, that Roger and Deanna write about um, that were part of the initial rollout strategy and part of kind of the way Google was approaching this broadly. Um, Ironically, at the request of the participants, that 2005 plenary, sadly, was not recorded. So I wish we could make that recording available, but um, we can't. Um, so C and I also lived through this experience. The book, which we're not going to summarize or reiterate, I'm just going to tell you to get it and read it. 
Um, uh, it's, a, it's a great book and I'm not gonna do the boring thing of uh, asking Roger and Deanna, can you please summarize the book in five minutes? We have better things to do with our time. Um, it tells the story of the prehistory of large scale digitization. It looks at some of the dreamers, some of their dreams and goals and then tells the story of Google's move and what that triggered in terms of fellow travelers, competitors, the efforts to open up parts of the collection that weren't clearly public domain, some very complex legal maneuvering uh, about what to do with the corpus once it was digitized, the ultimate failure of a very interesting and controversial class action settlement and through there the creation of Hadi Trust, which has been so critical during the pandemic, particularly to the humanities and social sciences as part of institutional, instructional, and research resilience. Um, it, it is fascinating the way this investment that was made for one purpose has turned out to be so critical for another purpose. And it puts me in mind, and this is the last thing I'm going to say before I start um, framing questions for um, Deanna and Roger. Um, it puts me in mind of the kind of underestimated um, importance of the Google book scanning project and its outcomes as a preservation strategy. I remember Mary Sue Coleman when she went in front of the American Association of Publishers, which was not happy about this project. Um, uh, she was the president at the time of the University of Michigan, one of the ringleaders and most ardent participants of the Google book scanning project. And she basically said words to the effect of, once she understood that this would provide a backup in case of catastrophe for the collections of the University of Michigan, she was morally obligated to move ahead with this project. And we can kind of see how that's played out in the pandemic. And um, uh, I, I think that um, that role as, preser as a step towards preservation and resilience has proved to be incredibly important. So let me ask a few questions um, that uh, really came to mind as I reread the book over the last couple of days. Um, one the thing that's always struck me is um, the way this captured the public imagination in a way that I've not seen anything else quite do. Um, people don't think like this about YouTube, despite the fact that YouTube has gathered up a amazing amount of film and video cultural heritage. Um, they don't think about the idea of the so-called celestial jukebox that um, uh, you know Napster used to represent, um, and that in fact the various music streaming services have come. Um, at the same time, you know we've collected up all these books here um, through the digitization project, and yet they are anything but a synthesis of knowledge. They are certainly not the final encyclopedia that you um, make passing mention of in the prehistory of the, um, of the uh, Google Books project, which in fact alludes to um, Gordon uh, Dickinson's uh, science fiction um, uh, um, uh, effort to create a, a orbiting compendium of knowledge around the earth. Um, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on your thoughts on why and whether and how this just so passionately captured the public imagination.
we need to unmute you too. Okay. Um, for one thing, I mean, it captured the imagination of librarians because Google was a surprise. You know, they didn't they didn't make many announcements beforehand. They just went to the five institutions, worked out deals, and and they started. And then other people learned about it. But um, in terms of the public, I I think the reason that they were so interested is that they could imagine a a digital library that they could go to and use. And it was something that was very appealing to the, to the broad public. I, I think that's exactly right. And I think that, you know, in a way the, um, uh, the celestial jukebox is a reflection of our cultural heritage, but um, the, Contents of the libraries, of course, also include our intellectual heritage as well. And I, I can't help but wonder if, if, if that, that both within our community, but also beyond it, um, really captured, you know, attention in a different, in a different kind of way. And, and of course, as Deanna says, you know, this was the, the stuff that libraries were collecting in a way that for better or for worse, um, you know, libraries have not had at the time did not have as big of a of a of an investment in some of these other kinds of media formats to to see the potential for being disrupted through Napster or YouTube or 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 whatever in quite the same in quite the same way. So, um, yeah, I think I think that was a big difference as well. Fascinating. Um, let me, let me take on another aspect of that. Um, so Google went for books. Um, it went for libraries. And as those of us who've worked with digital content know that books are in some sense the hardest case for moving digital, um, particularly if you want to do sustained reading as opposed to just, you know, check out a couple of pages. Um, you can't print books locally with most technology that's around um, uh, in the same way you can print, say, journal articles. They need a lot of bandwidth. They need a lot of navigation tools. Um, my experience when I was back at the University of California saw us move into journals pretty early in the um, latter part of the 80s. We started making online journals available. And certainly, uh, you know, when you look at the history of JSTOR, um, I believe that that significantly predated the work on, um, on uh, um, the Google Books project. Uh, uh, about a decade. Roger, of course, you know, is the chronicler of JSTOR. Um, so uh, I'm very interested in his views here. Um, why did why did Google just go for books and 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 not try and scoop up journals as well? Um, uh, um, it seems that particularly. Um, for some kinds of knowledge, the journals are going to be higher impact than the books. Um, thoughts on that? That's what a great question. I and I I don't know that I know the answer to what Google's thinking was on this. I mean, to your to your point, Clifford, large scale digitization of journal back files had started you know, roughly a decade before uh -oh. um, before the uh, before Google came on scene. Uh, with the books project. And so, you, you know, there's a, there is a case to be made that the journals problem uh, by no means was solved. I mean, we can certainly talk about open access and restrictions on access and, and discovery issues and all sorts of other things. But in terms of the actual digitization of some of the most significant um, elements of the journal literature in really across the different fields, um, you know, most of the major 
scientific publishers had already digitized their journal back files by by 2004 2005 <laughs> I, I think i think a, a detailed look would show so i uh yeah so i i think i think i think the books were just in a different in a different place it was seen as more of a title by title challenge as opposed to uh from the library perspective anyway as opposed to these you know publisher engagements with the journals where they were where they were scanning an entire back file for for an entire company and and selling them back to libraries, of course, is just a very different kind of kind of model. So, so in that sense, one might argue that it was really Google's willingness to take on the risk of thinking about a library's holdings very much like a like a back file of a journal, um, uh, where journal publishers understood the rights situation on the back file that was very clean, but the libraries had been thinking book by book for digitization and Google was willing to think about it as a back file. And maybe that was part of the leap. A back file, absolutely. And also, you know, at scale. at scale and thinking about risk management in a totally different way than anyone in our sector, I think probably <laughs> ever has. Um, that's an exaggeration, but I mean- Not will mention the expense. <laughs> yeah. No. Interesting, really interesting. So one of one of the pieces of um, the one, one of the central actors in the story you tell is our our friend uh, Paul Courant, um, uh, who you know really I think played kind of a pivotal role uh, in um, uh, getting uh, the University of Michigan to commit to. Pretty, basically doing comprehensive collection scanning and partnering. And there's, there's a sense in which um, the perfect is the enemy of, a good, of the good. And um, Paul was the great advocate of the good and the possible um, uh, in this story. Um, it feels like there's, there's a consistent thread of... Um, delays and roadblocks to the participation of other institutions because of lingering distrust of um, commercial partners, of Google's motives, um, of um, perhaps the potential disintermediation of libraries and librarians. I wonder if and I think your your the way you tell the story frames that very well. And I wonder if you could expand or reflect a little bit more on that. Well, um, one of the reasons I admire Paul Courant as much as I do is that he was willing to take the risk, and um, I. I think it might have been hard for Google to find many library directors who were willing to do it. I mean, they found five, obviously, but um, he was notable in his uh, willingness to take a risk and to tell the library community what he's doing. But, you know, that, that he just stuck with the facts <laughs> uh, throughout the the process process. So I I just have enormous respect. And writing the book helped me uh, put him in context more. That was very helpful for me. And I I see how much we owe him because other libraries then got interested in digitization projects and I think it's because of the leadership Paul showed. One of the things that has been a special um, treat for me in the process of writing the book has been some conversations that Deanna and I've had about leadership uh, in, <laughs> you know, in, in the library community and beyond. And I think one of the things that really characterizes Paul's leadership was a, a, a deep pragmatism um, within the goals or vision that you know he had he had um, come to come to hold, and uh, you know he definitely 
he and, and the team at Michigan and others definitely encountered all sorts of individuals who, you know, weren't, weren't sure that they wanted to take a pragmatic approach along the way. They had different kinds of principles and uh, it was, it was, a, it was a, it must have been a lonely experience at some points as, as well. And uh, um, I, th I think it's a very interesting study in not just Paul's leadership individually, but, but a, a, a group of people that, that collectively, um, you know, yeah. move, move this forward. And I think one of the reasons Paul was able to do it is he had been the provost at the University of Michigan and he had more maybe credibility or um, felt that he had a longer leash to play with. <laughs> um, he, he did very well and I think he inspired other librarians to um, to take a more responsible approach to their collections and start digitizing them and making them available. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you really, rereading the book, particularly for the second time, for me, really put Paul and his contributions in a in a very um, you know, clear light. Um, and I, I really appreciated that. Um, switching gears a bit, uh, one of the things that has always been striking um, is the cultural disconnect between Google, which is basically um, the culture of computer science, and libraries and the culture of librarianship. Uh, one of the things that Google just sort of doesn't get very well is metadata, cataloging, um, uh, the, and, and also cer certain niceties of additions and things like that don't seem uh, high on the list. Um, the the um, you know Google's approach to things has always been full text uh, processing and retrieval, and we've seen this, you know, again and again and again. Um, nowhere is that disconnect um, that that cultural inconsistency stronger than in the book's digitization project, I think. Um, and uh, I know um, Hadi has spent a lot of time trying to. Uh, deal with the legacy of that, but I wonder if you have thoughts on um, the, the extent to which that not only caused trouble, but ultimately proved to be something of a barrier um, in getting library buy-in to the Google work? Certainly, it was a, it was a big barrier. And, um, you know, if you remember, at the time Google started the project, they were writing that they wanted to digitize books because they could then add them to the database they were already developing and um, it would give much more content. And <clears throat> so I don't, you know, I don't think they ever saw this as a library project. Uh, they saw it as a way to get content for their database. Um, and librarians were offended, I think, because of the, the kind of sloppiness of the first uh, iteration of the project. Um, the microfilm, or not microfilming, the digitization was not terribly good at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality wasn't that good. And they mostly ignored the bibliographic process that goes along in libraries with digitizing materials. So I don't know. I think that Google had specific goals and set out to meet them and did. And libraries benefited a lot 
but it it took some time. <laughs> you want to add anything on that, Roger? I mean, I I just think it's a you know it's a, it's such a clear illustration of the difference between a kind of collections mindset and a data mindset sure. for exactly the same uh, content. But uh, yeah, I think Deanna said it really well. <laughs> I mean, one can almost imagine had things worked just a little bit differently, seeing all of these library collections sort of subsumed into the mass of stuff that one one um, uh, get one searches when one types in the Google search box, yeah. and losing the identity of a library versus stuff you know collected up off of the web. Yeah. Provenance, structure, all of mm -hmm. all of yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, there are so many things we could talk about. <laughs> um, let me let me use our last bits of time here, maybe to invite you to do some speculating. So, I look at where we've ended up with sound recordings and particularly popular music today, where we've ended up with video material. Both of these have gone to a sort of a streaming model where very few people own anything, um, where there are these huge, but at the same time, balkanized uh, masses of content out there. Um, the landscape for books is really different. Um, and it's different for a lot of reasons. Um, but I wonder if you would reflect a little bit on how what what the end game looks like for books in comparison to those other kinds of media. And further, if you might speculate a little bit, and this is really speculative now, Suppose the settlement had been accepted. Would that have changed the end state? Well, maybe I'll maybe I'll give a few thoughts, and, and Deanna may want to get into the counterfactual of what uh, what, <laughs> what what the world might look might, might have looked like otherwise. Um, you, you know, I think that I think that this. Um, you know, Deanna and I are, are both a, approach a, a lot of our thinking in this project in part through the lens of preservation, right? Not just discovery and access, but but also questions about preservation. And I think that, you know, in asking us to talk a little bit about the distinction between where we are with books and some of these other more, you know, streaming driven content types, I think I'll say for myself, it, it, it gives me great comfort to know that Hadi Trust exists, that the Internet Archive exists, that we have, you know, community controlled or community friendly, uh, not for profit services that have um, ultimately have control of the books and uh, the digitized books. And I think that that um, you know, the opportunities that I, I'll say I certainly didn't foresee the need for a pandemic emergency access program through Hadi Trust until all of a sudden we had a pandemic wasn't something I was planning for. Um, but, uh, but when that became possible, it became possible only because um, we weren't streaming that material from a third party, but because, um, because there was a, a, a community controlled organization that, that had, had that content. And I think we're seeing some really interesting next stage developments in, in books and what it means to have community control of books. And I think some of the initiatives around uh, controlled digital lending that have developed um, really accelerated over the last year or so, but, but we're, I think we're developing um, earlier certainly, it suggests a really different kind of model for a content type that remains a dual format content type when a library can, can simply buy a print copy um, and then scan it and lend it out digitally if, if uh, assuming that controlled digital lending passes the court tests that it faces. Um, and I think that just suggests a really, really different set of possibilities than um, you know, licensing a streaming service <laughs> or whatever, whatever content we, may be, we, we, we might think about instead. So 
Um, I'll, I'll just, I, I think that that's some of the ways in which the end game for books looks much more promising, I think, even if it's a more complicated landscape yeah. than, than we're seeing for some other content types. Yeah, I think you're right, Roger. Uh, and you know, the, the thing that I keep reminding myself of is libraries have been collecting materials for, a, for many decades and they have amassed collections that matter because of their longevity and because of the preservation issues. And it, um, I think once people start thinking about what the libraries have put together, it's, um, it's very impressive what they've done. So I, maybe the, the comprehensiveness of collections has mattered more over time than anything else about the collections. That's a really fascinating answer to that. Um, and, you know, I, I couldn't help thinking when you said, Roger, that it gives you comfort to think about where the books thing is landing. I, pessimist that I am, I, of course, flipped that around and um, was thinking, yes, and it gives me great angst to think about where the um, recorded sound and video world is and uh, how little of that is in any kind of uh, hands for uh, reliable preservation. I um, think that's absolutely that's right. And I think, that, and I think the, the counterfactual to explore there is what would have happened if if libraries had seen themselves as collectors of physical media in some of those content types in this, to the same extent that it was mission centric to think about, think about books. And you know, I, I, there's, a, there's a, lot, a, a lot of different scenarios we could, we, could, we could tease out there. All right, well, in our last couple of minutes, um, while we're doing scenarios, um, uh, Let's, let's look at the future as more and more born digital books come out um, uh, and, you know, perhaps less books come out in both print and digital form. Um, what happens to the great um, digitized collections going forward? Um, does, does book scanning and digitization and the work of Hadi in particular uh, kind of wind down. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not that it stops, it's not that the collection goes away, but it's, it, it starts growing slower and slower and uh, most of the growth um, in digitization moves on to the endless supply of undigitized special collections that our institutions hold. Um, how do you how do you see that that you know future playing out over the next 10, 10 or fifteen years? Well, I, I guess I'll say I, I do think that um, that attention is turning to distinctive collections. I don't think there's any any question about that and. I think there's a, an enormous amount of opportunity there, exactly as you as you say. Um, but I, I'm less clear on how much longer we are going to be in a dual format environment for for books. Um, certainly, our publisher wanted to publish our book about book digitization in intangible form. Um, you know, the economics mm -hmm. of of bookmaking and book selling. Um, the the reader, readership preferences remain, you know, to a very large extent grounded on the print format, um, mm -hmm. certainly for long form reading. And I don't think we're seeing as much evidence as folks might have anticipated a decade ago that that's going to change. Um, certainly, that it's changed as quickly as folks had had anticipated. So, so I I I'm not I'm not really prepared to say that. You know, I, I think what we're, I think what, what's unclear to me is whether print books will become like the vinyl of our streaming environment, or if 
or if print is is actually the optimal format for for long form reading. And I, I think I think the jury's still out on that, at least as I see it. Yeah, and I would add that um, you know for for a lot of people, the book represents a connection to the knowledge that's in it. And um, holding the book, reading the book in print matters to a lot of people still. Yeah. And I think that will continue for quite a while. Yeah, I think so too. I, that's so, that's really fascinating. Um, I think, I think we might have time for one comment or um, a question from the audience, if there is one, just, I think the simplest thing to do is pop it in the chat. Um, uh, and while, while people formulate that for a moment, I will say thank you very much, not just for talking with us today, but for writing this book um, is really, really important to uh, get this history out and to get it out while you know you could still you could still interview the firsthand sources. Um, uh, um, I think this is you know a, a book that people are going to come back to for many years, and um, it really documents a very pivotal moment in. Um, in our world, so um, I'm I'm so grateful to you for for writing it as well as for coming to talk about it and for everybody out there. Here's the book, here's the um, book. and uh, uh, I urge you all to read it. It's a it's a very um, brisk and enjoyable read. Thank you, Cliff, and thanks for the good questions you asked. And 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 if I could just say thank you to you and, and really to the whole CNI community that's been a part of this story and that's served as some of the most intellectually fertile ground, I think for both of us in shaping our, um, shaping our thinking on a lot of these topics. Yeah. All right, I, there, there is a, a question in, but I think, I think we're probably a little tight for time. Perhaps okay. one of you might want to um, uh, uh, say a word or two about it. Actually, there are a couple coming in that you might want to comment on in chat, um, but I think I think probably we need to uh, to wind down. We're going to take a short break here, and then we are going to come back at um, two ten uh, Eastern, um, so in about um, nine or ten minutes, uh, and we're going to start the first of our. Um, synchronous project briefings. Great. It's great um, to have you both here. Thank you so very much. Um, Thanks for having us. Thank you. We uh, appreciate it. Yeah. All right. See bye you bye. all in about 10 minutes. <laughs>